<laughs> okay, uh, let's begin. Um, so I'm Mike Hermely, one of the organizers for this meeting, together with Ashvin. Uh, I just want to welcome everybody back to the second day. Uh, so today we're going to start off with a session of uh, four short talks, um, 15 minutes uh, each, I would say plus some time for questions. And uh, Yi Zhuang Yo from uh, San Diego has generously uh, offered or been volunteered to chair this session. So uh, he'll be introducing our, our four speakers in turn. Okay, so the first talk will be given by Grisha Tarnopolsky. So let's welcome. <laughs> So my talk is going to be about uh, dance and this biography. Uh, it's uh, uh, related to work which was written uh, about the uh, about, about the and mm -hmm. work in progress with uh, Islam Halaf and Ashwin. So uh, a quick plan: uh, this is biography theme, continue models for this biography with major angles, and then web dance. <laughs> so first to as many people know, uh, to remind you about the layer 13, so if we take two uh, sheets of uh, 13 and uh, stack on top, on top of each other, we, we get a twist, we get a motor pattern, which has some uh, uh, lengths, L, which is the ratio of uh, uh, just even atoms uh, right by the table, and there are like uh, three important uh, regions of this motor pattern, this is called the A stacking region, the A stacking region. There are uh, many experiments right now, uh, and uh, I think many people agree that uh, where people found uh, uh, models later, trace conditions, perfect activity, the magnetic angle, and I think many people agree that uh, the appearance of the flat band in one particle spectrum is uh, crucial for uh, uh, for uh, relation physics. So, and uh, basically in this talk we are we are talking about uh, one particle physics and trying to understand uh, why uh, lead that forms in this model, in these systems. And uh, the starting point is uh, what's called a uh, continuum model for twisted by labor team. It's, uh, uh, it's described by a uh, 4 by 4 matrix Hamiltonian uh, where the diagonal parts are uh, Dirac, op uh, Dirac operators. And there is an interlayer uh, hopping potential, DR, DR, which is two way to matrix. And it consists of uh, quasi periodic uh, functions, C0 and e, DR, particular form which is not really important, but uh, what is important is uh, some symmetries which are uh, which <coughs> function, which is functions of the, uh, so especially uh, C3 rotation symmetry, so rotate this by by our free uh, angle, it, it acquires a phase. And uh, so people usually, what people do, they usually estimate uh, their angle at which the flat band can form. So this is just a uh, necessary condition. <coughs> so if we take uh, an angular velocity, basically, the direct velocity divided by Moira, Moira lengths and equate it with the hybridization energy, it gives a very good estimate. But, uh, do we always find the flat bands for, uh, for in, in this type of models uh, if we do it? And the answer is no. And suppose we consider a model where we take this continuum model and we switch off, off diagonal terms and only keep diagonal terms, uh, W, A, A. And uh, uh, we try to look at a spectrum, so I have a movie. So in this case, we won't see any flat band in flat band spectrum and there's some basic flat bands. So though there is a criteria for, for energy, uh, for energy is uh, satisfied, uh, is satisfied uh, there's, there's no flat band formation. So there's uh, some, uh, some mass spectrum. So there's no magic in this case. And, uh, but then like people in uh, Switzerland and Madonna, they consider a model where they have WA equals WA in this interlayer potential. And in this model, of course, we have uh, they found the, the flat band, uh, but it basically was a numerical observation. It wasn't really explained what the physics behind this flatness, and uh, 
they found the first major Green Gold blood this in the in the in, in, in equating other major Green Gold blood, we see that there, there's no flat band in other major Green Gold And uh, finally we arrived to what we call now parallel symmetric continuum model. It's the model where we use the opposite limit so we switch switch off diagonal terms and keep only off diagonal terms. And this we and we believe that this model is a core model of this uh, of this phenomena, uh, because we, we see this model exactly flat bands and they appear periodically with the twist angle, and they actually differ in the uh, And uh, it was noted uh, uh, by John uh, Crow that in this limit, in this parallel, uh, parallel symmetric model, this Hamiltonian uh, is represented as a direct fermion moving in the background on a field engage mode. <coughs> uh, where the uh, gauge components are related to the layer potential in this particular form. And it was noted by Inea that uh, the Lavinia nature uh, of the gauge field is, is important, uh, plays an important role for, for the flat band formation. For example, if we uh, say uh, neglect some tau, tau 1 component in the Lavinia gauge field, and this will effectively analyze the gauge field. And uh, we will see, the, and we will get, we check that flat bands will not uh, will, will not form. So the the nature, the nature nature of this uh, gauge field is important. Okay, before we go to here, uh, let us quickly discuss the realistic continuum model. So, in reality, uh, we don't switch completely WAA terms, but what people found that the lattice relaxation effects uh, they effectively shrink, uh, they effectively decrease WAA terms. So the, the ratio between WAA term divided by WAB term, which is called kappa, in the, in the real, in the reality is something close to 0 0.75. That was not found uh, in the papers. And so we can ask uh, how, how the, how the parallel, parallel symmetric model uh, related to, is related to, uh, uh, to the re realistic continuum model, where we don't have zero uh, AA terms. And for this, we can plot the overlap between uh, wave functions of the flat band of parallel model and of some model, of some continuum model with some uh, non zero kappa. And uh, it's, the kappa is, not, uh, kappa is not small, it's 0 0.7, so it's not in the perturbation limit. And uh, uh, for kappa equals at 0 0.6, uh, the red means that overlap is very close to one. So the wave functions of the of the <coughs> model with kappa, with kappa model with non zero kappa, which is 0 0.6, is almost very close to the chiral symmetric model wave functions. And when we increase kappa, it becomes a bit, a bit, a bit worse. But even even up to uh, kappa uh, to 0 0.8, which is realistic, it's still very good. Basically, we can claim that uh, the wave functions of the chiral symmetric model sort of capture uh, the wave functions of the real realistic model. Uh, and the nice thing is that we, we, we sort of know enough, we know we can find analytically wave functions of the, of the chiral symmetric model. And uh, okay, uh, what, what are the ingredients for the flat band? So if we uh, switch off the WAA term, uh, there are many, sim uh, there's uh, the the symmetry which appears, which is chiral symmetry, in, the, in this case the spectrum is exactly symmetric around zero. Also we can uh, neglect relative twist rotations for, for uh, sigma matrices. And what is very important is that uh, the spectrum always have stable, uh, protected uh, uh, drag zero modes, k, 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 k prime. And uh, it's true for, uh, for, any, for any angle, uh, and uh, because of some sort of uh, sort of construct some sort of twist index, so if we uh, consider Hamiltonian in uh, this particular representation, uh, we can check that it has a particle hole symmetry, but it also has, as I mentioned, uh, C3 symmetry. So if we're a Davis operator by uh, by a free angle, it acquired it multiplied by by phase. That means that there exists operator which commutes with the Hamiltonian commutes with the uh, sigma Z matrix. And basically, all, all uh, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian they fall into uh, different sectors of, of this uh, of the C3 operator, 
for six for one, this for six for omega star, six for omega, and we can check that at, at alpha equals zero, there's no interaction. We have two zero modes at six for one and six for omega star, which actually, which actually are related by six key symmetry. And uh, because we have particle hole symmetry, we cannot these modes cannot cannot uh, split, so it's always stay at the zero energy. That's why we always have this. Uh, zero modes for for arbitrary for arbitrary angle. It's sort of sort of uh, So then, uh, what, what is the next ingredient, which is important, is uh, <coughs> rules of the Dirac uh, point wave function. So we know now that if uh, Dirac uh, zero mode wave function has a root, uh, meaning that at some point uh, at the at some point the if, if the spinner is zero, then we can construct the flat, uh, flat band using data functions. But the still, the open question is uh, what are the conditions for the rack spinner to, to acquire a root? And we know that, as I mentioned, <coughs> on the previous page field is necessary for this. Because uh, now, for the key, if we, uh, build, uh, if we switch off some component, we have to, we, and we have uh, realized this gauge field, uh, we can solve uh, differential equation for the rack spinner exactly. And we see that the components of the spin are exponentials. And exponentials <coughs> cannot have zeros, they cannot have roots. So we can immediately uh, explain why, uh, in a Julian case, we cannot have flat band. <coughs> and, uh, and finally, uh, I would like to mention that uh, we consider uh, models with multi layers, chiral models with multi layers, with arbitrary uh, twists. So they cannot, they could be some commensurate twist between, uh, between say, Tri layers and in the chiral symmetric model, we always have uh, roots of the of the uh, drug uh, wave function. We always find that. Thank you. This S U T V field configuration that you described is it uh, something interesting? Is it like a, does it carry some topological problem? I'm just, it's just confusing that a topological property could change suddenly when you vary your view. Yeah, it's right. confusing, but that's the question. <laughs> uh, Did you find anything interesting? We have three layers. Uh, you have two twisty angles. Yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there's uh, also advanced view. There are many, like in two layers, there are many, so you can, there are many configurations. We wrote the paper with uh, <coughs> Islam where we consider alternating twists, so it's like data minus data data. In this case, we always have uh, almost the same physics as for for bilayer case, but we also can we also now consider in cases where we have different twists, like say, data one and data two, which are commensurate. So the ratio is some um, uh, some uh, some ratio of two integers. And in this case, we're also, we're also finding flat band. <laughs> uh, okay, <clears throat> if there's no further questions, we'll thank you. So the next speaker is Aslam Kala. <clears throat>
Um, so I'm going to talk today about some relatively recent conceptual development in understanding topological crystalline phases, in particular in relation to some subtleties in understanding the type of surface states we have and also uh, how these relate to bunny obstructions. The talk will be roughly based mostly on the first, on this first PRX that I wrote with Ashwin, Adrian Poo, and Haruki Watanabe. But if I have more, if I have time, I would also discuss briefly uh, some discussions from the second paper. So let me first review um, what are symmetry protected topological phases in the context of internal symmetries, not crystalline symmetries. And um, I'll be mostly focused on on the case of free Fermi systems. So the standard way to define uh, symmetry protected topological phases is through uh, the notion of adiabatic deformation. So we say that two phases are uh, belong to distinct symmetry protected phases if uh, if we cannot if we cannot deform one to the other without closing the bulk gap or breaking the symmetry. And this uh, this splits the space of uh, Hamiltonians into distinct classes, into distinct equivalent classes under this notion of adiabatic deformation that's captured by the so-called K group. In the context of uh, non-interacting systems, another way to define uh, bulk topology or gap phases is uh, through the existence of gapless surface states, which, is an which has an anomaly, which means uh, it cannot be realized in an independent uh, lattice system of uh, of the same dimensionality uh, with the same symmetries. A third way to define topology, uh, which is maybe less commonly used, is through the notion of uh, Vanier representation. And uh, in this context, we say something is topological if we cannot find the local basis of orbitals, which uh, represent all the symmetries naturally. For example, if we have a churn uh, churn band, we know we cannot find a, a local basis of orbitals that spans the same set of states as the states in this churn band. But also for something like a uh, time reversal symmetric topological insulator, what happens is because the churn number vanishes, you can find such representation, but this representation would necessarily violate that such basis of localized orbitals would, would not represent time reversal symmetry locally. And one subtlety here is that uh, the distinction to the left is a relative distinction. It only tells you that phase A and phase B are distinct without telling you which one is topological, while the distinctions here can be thought of in an absolute sense. So if I give you a phase, you can tell me whether you can find uh, localized orbitals, one year orbitals or not. In the, but once we fix uh, once we fix the zero of the relative distinction, for example, to be the the phase which has an a Vanier representation, we can establish an equivalence between these three modulo sum caveats. So if something is topologically non-trivial, which means it cannot be deformed to an atomic insulator, we know that it also has surface states and a Vanier obstruction. Now, in the context of crystalline or spatial symmetries, these these different notions of topology become a lot more subtle, and also the relationship between them becomes a lot more subtle. So we have also here relative and absolute distinctions. Uh, and for example, we know that if we have something that has surface states and something that doesn't have surface states, then we, we cannot deform them into each other. But the, the opposite direction is, is not true. So you can have two distinct atomic insulators that uh, so that are trivial from the point of view of surface states and value obstructions, but are distinguished from relative to each other. What I'd be, be mostly concerned in this talk is the discussion of the distinctions on the right-hand side, basically the nature of surface states and value obstructions have, and how they relate to each other. So for surface states, um, the standard way to think of surface states uh, in a crystalline setting is to basically look at this crystal surface that preserves the symmetry. So these are the standard uh, Dirac surface states, for example, you would find in a mirror churn insulator. However, it was recently realized that this, is, this, is, this requirement is too restrictive. And there are some types of surface states which are basically one-dimensional and live on hinges of the sample, one-dimensional hinges of the sample, 
that rely on a global topology of the surface rather than looking at a specific surface, at a specific face of the crystal, which are usually called higher order surface states. And uh, my purpose in this talk is to understand the connection between two, these two and hopefully find a unified description of surface states of TCIs, which the hope would be that to, uh, to help us obtain a full classification or a full understanding of surface states in this setting. And yeah, the answer is yes, we can actually find a unified description that, uh, that gives us the full picture that could give us a full classification of surface states in this setting. Um, another, another subtlety in, is in, in the notion of bunny obstructions. So it was realized recently that in the crystalline cons uh, in the crystalline setting, not all bunny obstructions are the same. <coughs> there is a class of bunny obstructions that's so-called fragile, which means you have a system that doesn't have a bunny representation. You add to it something that's atomic, and then you get something that has a bunny representation, which means you have something that's topological, you add to it something that's trivial, and the result is trivial. So these came to be known as fragile phases. Um, and one of the one of the purposes of of the talk uh, is to understand the relationship between bunny obstructions, particularly once we make the distinction between stable and fragile phases and surface states. Again, one direction this correspondence is clear. If you have surface states, you know you have a stable bunny obstruction, simply because atomic insulators and fragile phases cannot have stable surface states. However, the other way around is not obvious. So. If you have a stable bunny obstruction, it's unclear that you always have surface states. A third interesting question is about the nature of fragile phases. Uh, we're basically, in the standard setting, we think of topological phases as having some uh, quantized responses. For example, we can have a quantized pumping of some quantity, or we can have a uh, fractional charges or states bound to defects. And the question is whether these fragile phases, although they don't have surface, uh, surface states, could have some response of this type. And I think because of time constraints, I mostly talk about the first question, and maybe if I have time about the second question. But the answer to the third question is also contained in our paper, and, and the short answer is yes. You can have a fragile, a model of a fragile topology that uh, that has quantized pumping of some of in that case it was angular momentum and it could also have fractional charges bound to the defects so let me for, let me go for the first uh, the first example or or the first discussion of surface states <coughs> and what i will discuss is usually called second order topological insulator and it's basically built as follows so we start with two copies of a strong 3D TI that's inversion symmetric. And we place it on a, some generic inversion symmetric surface. So let's, we can think of it as a sphere. So we place two copies of a strong 3D TI on a sphere. We can write the surface theory in general in terms of some Dirac theory, some two copies of the Dirac theory. So here tau represents the Pauli matrices in the space of copies. And here I'm considering the generic uh, curved surface so the Hamiltonian at a point is specified by a, by a point on the surface and the vector, a momentum vector in the tangent space to the, to the surface. Since we know that, uh, that strong TIs have a Z2 index, uh, we know that when we add two copies of them, we can trivialize them, which means that the surface states can be gapped out. But the important observation here is there is only a single time reversal symmetric mass term that we can, we can write to gap, out the, uh, to gap out the Dirac cones. And now we want to know what, uh, what constraints does inversion symmetry place on such mass term. And we see that the, the form of inversion symmetry is some matrix operator acting on this uh, mass term, yielding this, the value of the mass term as an inversion related point. And then we find that we have two possibilities. If this matrix operator commutes with the mass matrix, then we find that the mass scalar uh, will have to be equal between a point and its inversion-related copy. While if they anti-commute, then the mass, the, the mass term has to change sign. And from this, we find that in the second case, if the mass term has to change sign, we will have to have a domain wall 
uh, living on some inversion symmetric curve on the surface that we cannot get rid of without breaking inversion symmetry. And as we know, if we have a domain wall in a Dirac equation, it would, ha it would have to host some one-dimensional uh, propagating, in this case, helical modes. And uh, the main message of, of our work is that this type of, uh, of reasoning can be applied to understand all types of surface states. So for example, let's imagine we are in class A2 in three dimensions. So we have time reversal symmetry with, with strong spin orbit coupling. If we have a generally uh, some general surface that satisfies some symmetries, and we look at the patch, at like the tangent space to a point, <coughs> then the action of, uh, of spatial symmetries on, on this patch either maps it to a different point or leaves one point invariant or one line invariant. If the spatial symmetry does nothing, then the only local symmetry that exists is time reversal symmetry. And we know that the only way that we can have a stable gapless states in a time reversal symmetric context in class A2 is to have a Z2 type one dimensional topological defects. The same also can be said when we have, when the symmetry leaves only one point invariant, for example, like with rotational symmetry. And then the only special case is when a symmetry leaves a line invariant, like if it's a mirror symmetry. In this case, along the symmetry, along the, the symmetry invariant line, we have a Z2 internal symmetry that can block diagonalize the Hamiltonian in two blocks that don't have time reversal symmetry and then belong to class A. And class A uh, can stabilize Z-type topological defects rather than Z2. So using this simple argument, we, we can reach a unified way of understanding all types of surface states. So we say all surface states are just locally look like topological defects of a Dirac equation. <coughs> And they are where the spatial symmetry enforces them globally. So the spatial symmetry is responsible to the global stability that we cannot get rid of these by smooth deformation. But the local stability just follows from the, lo the local symmetries, which are like time reversal symmetry. Or in case of mirror, uh, mirrors, the action of mirror symmetry on the mirror plane, which is an internal symmetry. And to see how this gives you a unified understanding, we can consider some of the symmetries like mirror or rotation, which we know protects standard types of surface states. And in this case, what we need to look at is a tangent plane to, to this generic surface at a symmetry invariant point. And we find that if we have some one-dimensional uh, de topological defect uh, that's pinned to a certain high symmetry point, and we attach a tangent plane at this point, we get a 2D uh, 2D gapless Dirac dispersion that we cannot get rid of. While if we have something like inversion, like I showed last slide, where the where the mode, where the line where the mass gap uh, where the mass gap disappears, is on a generic inversion symmetric surface, it means it's not pinned to a, pin to a given point. What would happen if we attach a surface uh, a tangent plane to the surface is that basically we can easily remove this domain wall and get a completely gapped surface. So this approach kind of includes both types of states, these more subtle uh, one-dimensional modes that depend on a global feature of the surface and also the, the standard types of surface states that, that are tied to specific symmetry invariant cases. And not only does this approach give us this uh, this unification, it also gives a very simple description of all types of surface states. Because basically it describes any type of surface states as a some surface mass texture of some Dirac equation. Which means actually we can map the problem of classifying surface states to the problem of classifying homomorphisms from the symmetry group to Z2. Basically telling us, uh, so <coughs> the only information we need to know what type of surface states exist is how the mass term transforms under each symmetry. And whether this transformation rule is just by a plus or a minus sign. So this is why we get this homomorphism to Z2. And actually using this, we have been able to generate a full classification <coughs> of surface states in, in class A2, so with strong spin orbit coupling, in the 230 space groups. And for example, I show here the 32 point groups. And we see that all classifications are either Z2 or Z, where Z comes from mirror and Z2 comes from all other symmetries. And actually this approach can also be used to, 
discuss more complicated setting where, where we have a Dirac equation with more than one mass term. For example, if we have a superconducting class, and in this case, you can have the, set, the situation where both <coughs> mass terms change signs, so you get, uh, you get zero energy states rather than like one dimensional states where, where you get a vortex of these two mass terms or this mass vector. And uh, I think I won't have time to, to discuss the, the other part of my talk about the relationship to value obstruction, but the simple answer to what I said is that uh, we know that if we have surface states, we, can have, we have a stable value obstruction because simply atomic insulators and fragile phases cannot have surface states. But what we showed in this, in this work is that if you have stable Vani, uh, Vani obstructions, you also have surface states. So there's one-to-one -one correspondence between the existence of surface states and Vani obstructions. We showed it in the context of point group TCIs, so TCIs protected by point group symmetry, based on the layer construction developed uh, in works from Mike Hermel's group. But also, it was this, uh, this approach was recently extended to the case of space groups in a very nice paper by, by Zida Song, Mike Hermel, and Shen Fang. And this approach can also be used to obtain some classification, the reduction of TCI classification in the presence of interactions. So yeah, here is the end of my talk. And my main, my, the main message was uh, about a unified understanding of TCI surface states as uh, symmetry enforced topological defects. And that this approach is very powerful. It can allow you to obtain full classifications of surface states in whichever symmetry class you want. And the second message, which I didn't have time to explain in detail, but it's that the notion of uh, stable value obstructions and the existence of surface states are equivalent in the context of PCIs, which is, which is what we wanted in a sense, or it's, it establishes the relation between TCIs and topological phases protected by uh, internal symmetries. So thank you. I had a question which was actually <clears throat> about the very last slide that you flashed so <laughs> fast that we couldn't see it. This um, one? No, 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 no. The one about interaction reduction of the yeah. classification. Um, so, uh, well, let's see. I'm not going to be able to process it that quickly. <laughs> but uh, I, well, here, here's my question, I guess, since it looks like maybe you've thought about this now some more recently. So I know mm -hmm. that, um, okay, so we know that if you have a, TCI protected by a single mirror symmetry, then there's a reduction from Z to Z8 of the mm -hmm. classification by interactions. So what I was wondering is, you know, if you have something like two perpendicular mirror planes, mm -hmm. uh, is the only option that you just reduce Z cross Z to a product of Z8s, or can there be more? Could there be some more subtle uh, uh, beyond that? I think my immediate answer would be yes, that is probably Z to Z8. But sometimes this adjoining condition that you can add uh, <coughs> two copies of the system uh, could generate some non-trivial factors. Actually, what I did here and what we did in our work is for TCIs that don't have surface states, so that reduce to 0D. So what we worked out, essentially, is the classification of uh, 0D systems with an internal <coughs> ZN symmetry under this adjoining condition. And in that case, you can have some non-triviality. So you can get this Z if you have the internal symmetry is Z6, you can get a Z12 times Z3, for example. And it's, it's not obvious how all such factors would, would emerge. So it could happen that in the case of mirror, you could also, there are, could be some context where this adjoining operator uh, leads to some non-trivial factors. But when I thought about it, I thought they are all reduced to Z, Z to Z8. So. Mm. Yeah, when you have a crystal uh, symmetry, a uh, surface may break some symmetry. Yeah. So there's a concern that uh, the surface don't have full symmetry, so maybe you have a gap on the surface. Yeah. So uh, I wonder, yeah, you, you seem to have a pretty strong results. Yes, so, so the, the, the statement is the following, that you, it, for example, for point groups, you can always choose yeah, a surface that, yeah. that preserves everything. But if you have something like a screw or glide, then then our statement is that there is always a surface that can distinguish these two phases. So if you have a, if you have a phase that, 
is protected by both screw and some other symmetry such that there is no surface that's consistent with both, then you have to look at two surfaces, two distinct surfaces to distinguish this phase from other phases. But these two surfaces, are they have to be gapped or can be, can they be gapped, not have to be gapless? So, so when the, I say surface state, you mean gapless states? Yeah, but what I mean about a surface consistent with the symmetry, it doesn't have to be a face that's a plane consistent with the symmetry, but the surface as a whole should preserve the symmetry. Yeah. And then you would just have to test your state against different surfaces that preserve different symmetries to see the gapless states. The concern is that when you have translating symmetry, you probably, let me see, I wonder you can have a, maybe you never have a surface which you preserve with translation symmetry. The point group you can always preserve. Yeah, but uh, so for a, for, a, for a single translation along one direction, you can always get that surface. But it could happen that if you have some translation and some screw, yeah. you cannot you cannot ha find the surface that simultaneously does both. But then since the, the, the structure always decomposes into an index attached to weak uh, to translation, an index attached to the other symmetry, you can basically test your phase again uh, on two different surfaces. But also there was a more recent the, the, the paper by uh, by Mike Mike's group and other people they had an alternative <coughs> approach to, to the same problem that uses the bulk, not the surface, and they, they got exactly the same results. Okay, due to the time limitation, yeah, let's say Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> the next speaker is from Mike Mike Mike's I'm going to talk to you today about a uh, work which is uh, not published yet, but hopefully will, will appear soon. Uh, it's with uh, Wen Wei Ho and Philip Dimitrescu. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about topological phases out of equi equilibrium. I think generally what we've heard about in, in this workshop is being topological phases in equilibrium, which basically means uh, you have some, some Hamiltonian and it has a ground state that is is gapped, and then the topological order lives in the gapped ground state of this Hamiltonian. So that's, of course, there are many interesting topological phases that can occur in that context, but uh, maybe at some point we get bored of that and we want to do something new. And uh, one really great phenomenon which allows us to do something new is this thing called many-body localization, MBL. So you have strong disorder in your system and it, it does something very non-trivial. It makes every eigenstate of your Hamiltonian look like a, a gapped ground state. Um, so instead of just having just one state, you can talk about the whole spectrum, and they, they all have some kind of topology. So, so, so in, you have this Hamiltonian, and then it has its actual ground state, which of course is a gapped ground state, but then um, every other eigenstate can be represented as a gapped ground state of some, some Hamiltonian, a different Hamiltonian, fictitious Hamiltonian. So it has the nice properties which allow us to talk about 
topological order. And so we can talk about that for every single eigenstate uh, of a many-body localized Hamiltonian. And another consequence of many-body localization is this uh, quasi-local integrals of motion. So there's a complete set of operators, which we call tau iz. They're quasi-local, and they commute with the Hamiltonian. Um, so you can show that this implies this property implies the previous one, because you can just make a fictitious Hamiltonian by just taking some sums of these tau iz's. Uh, and the eigenstates, of course, of the Hamiltonian are also eigenstates of these tau iz's, because they all commute. Um, and then, right, so as I said, uh, we can talk about different topological regimes of many body localized systems, um, because uh, the eigenstates can, can carry topological phases. Uh, and it's not, not the ground state, but it's all the eigenstates in this case. Okay, but that, that still doesn't give us like new classifications, because uh, the eigenstates just look like ground sets of gapped Hamiltonians again, so the classification at least will be the same. Um, but we want to go even further than that, and so one way to do that is to talk about a uh, Floquet MBL. So we talk about a periodically driven system, the Hamiltonian is time dependent, but uh, it uh, has some period, capital T, so the Hamiltonian comes back to itself after that driving period. Uh, and then uh, in this case we can construct a discrete time evolution operator, which I call UF, which is for um, the you know, the, it just unitary, unitary describes the time evolution of the Hamiltonian over one driving period. And then if you want to go to late times, you just take the powers of UF. So it's a discrete time evolution operator. Uh, and then uh, if you have a disorder, you can have Floquet MBL, which means, again, do you have these uh, quasi-local integrals of motion? This time, rather than commuting with the Hamiltonian, I mean, the Hamiltonian is time dependent, so they can't commute with all the Hamiltonians. Instead, they commute with uh, just the Floquet operator UF. And so that's uh, Floquet MBL, and this again applies, implies that the eigenstates of uh, this unitary operator are, are or look like gapped ground states. So we can talk about topological order in these eigenstates of this UF. Um, okay, but that still doesn't give us new classifications, because uh, again it's just gapped ground states. But now, now we can, it turns out that in the driven case you have extra topological information rather than just the, uh, um, rather than just the eigenstates. And the way that arises is my clicker on this take this moment to die. I believe I believe it might have. Uh, okay. Or is it my laptop that froze? Uh, what's going on here? saying that for a periodically driven system, it's not just the topological phase of the eigenstate, um, there's new topological data involved. And the reason for that is going to have these micro-motions. So let's say be an eigenstate of the UF, uh, then I can talk about how it evolves in time. So I uh, take this, this state and I evolve over time under the full time-dependent Hamiltonian, and then it gives you time-dependent state. So we know that by definition, uh, because it's an eigenstate of a Floquet operator, um, it has to come back to the same state after time capital T, because UF is for 
evolution over time can rotate. Um, but in the meantime, between time zero and time t, you can actually do some non-trivial time evolution. So in fact, it gives you a loop in the space of gap around states. Uh, so you have the state psi, and then it can go through some loop as a function of time. And then after one priming period, it comes back to the same value. So that's a micro motion. But this loop could be trivial or it could be non-trivial. You can have a loop that is non-contractible. So that's actually some non-trivial uh, um, non-trivial topological information, uh, which can only happen in, in driven systems. Yeah. How do you know that all of the intermediate states are like the gap of states? Oh, because uh, it's, it's your time evolving on the same Hamiltonian. So local Hamiltonian has some preserves some notion of locality. So you just take the Hamiltonian that is a parent Hamiltonian at one time and conjugate it by the Time of which you a new that is current state. Well, t is small compared to something. Right, I mean, t goes basically from zero to capital T, and then it starts over again. Like, it's periodic, so it starts over. So, so capital T has to be small compared to triplet system size. Right, capital T is a border one compared to the system size. We're talking about some formula limits. Um, yeah, so we have this non contractible loop, so there's some extra topological data in this driven case. And then we have to say, how do we classify these loops? Uh, answer turns out to be very simple. Uh, classification of loops, and then maybe we'll impose some extra internal symmetry G, uh, is in one to one correspondence of the classification of stationary phases, actually, stationary phases with uh, symmetry G times Z. So it's like, it's as if you have, in terms of classification, it's as if you had a stationary phase, like a undriven phase, but it has this extra symmetry. And what is this extra symmetry you represent? It represents discrete time transition symmetry, because that's associated with time periodicity, you have this discrete time transition symmetry. So you can talk about topological phase protected by discrete time transition symmetry. That's what's going on here. But you only have to change the dimension by one? You do not have to change the dimension. It's in the same dimension. Um, well, I mean, so the, you're asking like space versus space time. Also. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. It's always, but, but you always just use the space dimension in this classification. Um, okay, so this story has been around for, for a few years now, but now I want to go even further than this. Um, so this, you have this Z, which is kind of linked with some symmetry of dynamical origin, discrete time translation. And suppose I want to make more, have <coughs> spaces protected by even more dynamical symmetries than just a single Z. I suppose I want z times z. Okay, so all I have to do, I find the universe in which there's two dimensions of time, right? And then I time translate on both time dimensions, and I just get that z times z time translation. Uh, I don't know, some, some high idea theorists have written about things like that. Anyway, this is not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to be much more down to earth than that. Uh, it turns out you can kind of simulate this in a different way. So you have quasi periodic time dependence. Uh, so you have some Hamiltonian H of t, and it depends on time. Again, not periodically as before, but quasi-periodically. So quasi-periodically means like you have uh, some, you have two frequencies, for example, but they're incommensurate, so their ratio is irrational. Uh, irrational ratio is superposed, superpose those two frequencies. So there's no, period, there's no single period anymore, um, but it's still true that if you take, for example, a Fourier transform, it will have some discrete sharp peaks. Uh, so that's quasi-periodic driving. It's like the, the time version of the um, and another way to say that is that you have a function which, um, a periodic function on which depends on two variables, and then you take a cut through this function. And so this, the actual time is going to live along this red line, which is an irrational angle going through this two-dimensional space, two-dimensional periodic space. So if you just uh, take this projection at any time, you just take, you go along this red line to some value, and then that's a value of a function of that time. Uh, that gives you a quasi-periodic function. But in a certain sense, the system is going to remember this periodicity, this, this extended space picture of a quasi-periodicity, where you have periodicity but in two different dimensions. The system is going to remember that, even though you're projecting on, along the single time dimension. Uh, and that's, that's what I mean, you have two time translation symmetries. Uh, okay, but the burning question, before I even address that, I, I said that many body localization is the key to get interesting to, non equivalent topology, but can you have many body localization in quasi periodicity that's not a question which anybody has answered before, but we will answer it in our upcoming paper. Um, and uh, the answer is yes, with an asterisk. Uh, we will only show that it's uh, 
and they have to stable up to a time, but it's exponentially long in the frequency. So it, 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 in, in high frequencies, I mean, at high frequencies, the lifetime is exponentially long. So it's a, maybe a metastable state rather than a completely stable state, but still, it's interesting topology, at least in that metastable regime. Um, and then, but we also even, even, we have to rethink even what we mean by many vertical localization. Normally, you say that you, in many localization, it's defined to say that you have a complete set of quasi local integrals of motion, but uh, integral of motion means it commutes with the time translation operator. But what is the time translation operator for quasi periodic driven system? Well, there really isn't one. Um, I mean, you can do the full time dependent evolution, but there's no single time translation operator. Uh, so instead of doing that, I'll say that I have many vertical localization. If the uh, have a if we have some complete set of operators tau i z, uh, I don't say that they have to be integrals of motion. I just say that they have to evolve quasi periodically under the Heisenberg evolution of the full time dependent Hamiltonian. So that's a very non trivial property. If a, I had an ergodic system with, that wasn't many vertical localization, I would expect that any operator should spread holistically under Heisenberg evolution, which is definitely not quasi periodic. So this is a you know, a very important, very special property, which is basically the definition of MDL with quasi periodic gravity. And then, so that's what we show can, can, have, can occur. And then I talked before about eigenstates of time evolution. Again, there's no time evolution operator, but I can still say that the simultaneous eigenstates of all these tau IZs, those are the, my notion of eigenstates now. Like before, before, when I had this time evolution operator, there, it was also eigenstates of the tau IZs. But now I just would define the eigenstates to be the eigenstates of the tau IZs. Those are the states I will consider. Uh, so now uh, we can talk about micromotions. Again, we take this eigenstate and consider its evolution of time. Uh, and it will also be quasi periodic, just because of this property of uh, local integrals of motion. Because of the properties of these tau IZs, uh, as I said, that they're quasi periodic under Heisenberg evolution, it means that uh, the states, which are defined to be the eigenstates of these things, will also evolve quasi periodically. Um, and then, so now we need to classify quasi periodic micromotions. Topologically, how do we do that? Well, uh, one way to talk about quasi periodic time dependence is we have this state, which is a function of a single time. But then I, I can introduce this uh, state, this new function, new state, which is a function of two variables, theta one, theta two. So these are phase, some kind of phase angles, so they're, they're two time periodic. So uh, they, they, the configuration for these on a torus now. Uh, and then, so I have this function state, which is a function of two variables, but to get the actual time dependence, which is a function of a single variable, basically I trace out a path through the torus, a straight line path, but a, an irrational angle again. And then what I can check is that because of the ratio of the frequencies being irrational, um, that actually, uh, as time goes on, you actually trace out a dense orbit on this torus. So basically you're exploring the full two-dimensional torus, even though, even though you only had a one-dimensional path. Um, so really what we need to classify is we need to classify maps from the torus into the space of gap ground sets. Before it was mapped from the circle, which was the loop, but now it's mapped from the torus into the space of gap ground sets. Uh, so how do we talk about to classify these? So it turns out, I mean, we can, yeah. Um, uh, I can make this more general. I want to classify a map from any space x into the space of gap ground sets. And then I will set x to be the torus later. Uh, well, it turns out that uh, maybe it's not that well known fact, but the answer is already kind of there. Um, if you think about the general framework we've developed to understand topological phases, we can mark since the answer is already in there, even though maybe you didn't know it. Uh, here are some references discussing aspects of that. It's not a complete list. Um, so this is very general. Uh, it's, it, this can be principle can be applied for SPTs, SETs, for the whole thing. Um, but let me just give you one example. Uh, we know that the sonic SVTs of internal symmetry G are classified by this uh, cohomology, the singular cohomology of the classifying space of coefficients in Z. Uh, often people write this group cohomology because it's the most general way to write, write it. Um, then it turns out if we want to classify maps from X into the space of gap ground states and we impose some internal symmetry G, usually all you do is you take a single cohomology and you place P G with X times P G. And so that gives you the classification, or at least partial classification. We know that the, this classification is not complete, so certainly this one is not complete, but it's a partial classification. Um, and so um, that's the answer in this case. And then and more generally, it turns out you always basically just replace BG with X and BG. Um, because BG always features in the classification of topological phases somehow. And so you just replace that with X times BG. 
So BG, remember, is the flat plane space for the group G. Uh, OK, so from that general considerations, we can derive the consequences in of this case of the torus. So the classification of maps from the torus into a space of gap ground states for internal symmetry G uh, is in one to one correspondence with the classification of stationary phases and equilibrium gap ground state phases with uh, symmetry G times C times C. So this is the two quote unquote time transition symmetries that I promised you. Um, so in terms of the classification of phases, at least, this is in the case that it has two uh, independent time transition symmetries. <coughs> so we can talk about topological phases particularly by two dimensional discrete time transition symmetry. Okay, and then finally, uh, this is the general classification. I should tell you now about observable signatures, but okay, we haven't really worked that out yet. Uh, but uh, I think I want to challenge the audience to, to think about these things. I think, uh, I think this should be a very rich set of, of phenomena to explore in this new context. So hopefully there will be some nice things to see. What's special about time? If I do it in space, does it work? Uh, Suppose I set up a decommensurate way. I mean, it might. I mean, it's, 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 it's less clear in what sense for, for a, 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 you know, if you have a, some SPT in space, but with, you know, in a quasi crystal, it's less clear in what sense it's a map from space into the space of ground states, right? Because you have. Uh, I mean, that would, in, that would be saying that at each point in space you have a whole many body point state, which is not really the case. You could sort of imagine if, if your state varies slowly enough in space that, that that would work. And in fact, that's the, uh, that's the approach we took, me and, and Ryan took in our, our classification of crystalline SPTs. We kind of assumed that that would work. So maybe it also works for quasi crystals, but it's hard to like prove that. What's the. What is there? Is there? Um, what's the notion of stability for these phases when you say you construct these topological invariants? Can I vary like the ratio of the frequencies? Uh, yeah, you, you can vary the ratio of the frequencies. I think. But then it seems yeah. that if I vary them to a rational uh, angle, then I only have one time translation, which is whatever the greatest common denominator is. Yeah, but it's sort of like if it's if it's some very large fraction. Like it's rational with some really large fraction, large number, very large number. You know, it's like distinguishable from an irrational number, like only at very late times. So that's the sense in which there's some kind of continuity. Wow. Sorry for the time limitation. That's the same problem. Yes. <laughs> so the next speaker is doing now. <clears throat> Today I'll talk about symmetry and topology in non-emission systems. Uh, so I guess lots of people may wonder why we have to study non-emission systems, because most relevant physical systems are all non-emission. But I want to remark that there are some interesting things to study for non-emission systems. A most well-studied example is the classical photonic systems, where the radiation loss or material gain loss naturally give rise to the non-emission terms that describe the, the light amplitude. Uh, another example is the time evolution of the open quantum system described by the Lindelof master equation when it's conditioned to the no jump event. So, in this kind of non emission system, there are some very unique features, such as noble band structure, uh, namely uh, exceptional point line or surfaces. And actually, uh, I found out that there is this a recent work by some of the audience where they found this non unitary CFT at the the non-emission association model. And I believe that although non-emission systems are not really a standard thing, there might be something we can learn from 
third mission instance, like ADCFT, right? Like ADS is not real space time that we're living in, but we learn a lot from them. And today I'll focus on another mission band topology and its correspondence to the higher dimension of Hermitian systems. I, one very intuitive picture is this this one. Uh, we can think about one the Chiron Hawking model, which is definitely a non Hermitian because there's no Hawking back. And the long time dynamics of this model resembles the edge of integer polynomial, which is the like, two dimensional Hermitian system. So Let's keep this in mind, and let me a brief review uh, non-interacting band topology. So to talk about topology, we first have to impose a certain constraint. And constraint we impose here is that we set certain Fermi energy, and we only allow bands to be deformed within, below that Fermi energy. Because without any constraint, any like band structure can be trivialized, and we'll be able to consider a topology here. So after imposing further constraints by uh, setting the symmetry like time reversal particle Carl, we can talk about this famous tempo wave classification. And we can do similarly for non-emission systems. The difference is that now the system is non-emission, eigenvalues can be complex, and there can be two different ways to impose constraint. One is a point constraint, and the other one is a line constraint. Actually, a line constraint is very similar to the Hermitian case, because after the spectral flattening, so line by line constraint, what I mean is that you can deform the band structure as long as you don't cross this like red line. So after spectral flattening, it will just become the usual like Hermitian case. And actually, the consequence of this, the topological invariant defined with respect, with respect to this line constraint is exactly the same as the like, Hermitian one. This one will give us the familiar bulk boundary correspondence. And that's what actually lots of people study in this non-Hermitian state stage model or like non-Hermitian trend insulators. You have this line and you have these two bands separated and they can be connected by some boundary modes. So what's really unique for non-Hermitian case is this uh, point condition where your band can be deformed as long as you don't cross certain points. And this gives completely new uh, kind of topology, which is unique for the lunar mission systems. So we focus on point game topology. And before getting into classification part, let me uh, talk about the symmetries in lunar mission systems, the non-trivial evolution symmetries. So in the Hermitian case, there are three basic symmetries, and combined symmetry classes, there are 10. In the lunar mission case, there are actually four, because now you can talk about the pseudo-hermeticity, and in the earlier work by Bernard and Leclerc, the combined symmetry, symmetry classes, equivalent symmetry classes, were counted to be 43, but uh, we actually counted properly again, it turned out to be 38. It's a small detail. And let me <coughs> describe the meaning of each symmetry. So, P symmetry is the usual chiral symmetry whose a consequence is giving an eigenvalues in a positive negative pair. And Q symmetry is the pseudo hermeticity. And when it exists, you can combine it with the, your non Hermitian Hamiltonian to make the Hermitian, which contains the same information. And C and K are somewhat special. So C is a complex conjugation, uh, C is a transpose in case complex conjugation symmetry. And depending on uh, the existence of them, would affect how like, the spectrum behaves. So, one may think that complex conjugation symmetry generalized uh, the time reversal, but actually complex conjugation symmetry be more like a particle hole where this guarantees uh, eigenvalues to appear in pair. And this uh, transpose symmetry actually gives rise to a Kramer's degeneracy by called the, we called it a biorthonormal Kramer's degeneracy and proved it. It's actually simple, but when transpose symmetry is first to minus one, then we can show that uh, there's an exact Kramer's degeneracy like behavior. So, since this is non uh transpose and complex conjugations are different, and each of them can be commuting or anti commuting with Hamiltonian. So, this equivalence classes are labeled by this, uh, this epsilon CK, like, and also the commutation between those symmetries. So, how are we going to classify this problem? Uh, so actually, strategies mapping this problem to the familiar Hermitian uh, classification problem. 
So first, we uh, define the Hamiltonian with respect to a certain base energy, the, the point in the compost energy space where we do not allow spectrum to uh, pass through. And then we unitize it, which is like a spectral flattening procedure. And then by doubling the like Nernst and Hamiltonian, we can permissionize it. It's like the technique used for classifications of Floquet systems. Uh, but uh, since we doubled the Hamiltonian, we introduced some kind of redundant degrees of freedom, and we got additional Kara symmetry, and all the other symmetries become doubled like this as well. Then the complex gap closing for non emission U will be equivalent to real gap closing for double Hamiltonian H, H U. And this symmetries and double Hamiltonian follows this kind of commutation rules, and this is exactly like the Clifford algebra. So the problem reduces into a Clifford algebra extension problem where uh, we classify the topologically distinct way to add the uh, mass terms for given representations of the Clifford algebra. So symmetries and uh, momentum matrices uh, become a generator of, some, of the Clifford algebra, and we're basically counting the topologically distinct way to add this mass term. And it's a very well studied problem. Once we map problem to this, then it's very easy to solve. So this is the result. One subtlety here is that uh, we have like more symmetries than what's there for usual 10 force classes. So some symmetries combine to get unitary, like the reflection symmetry and uh, give like mapping real class into the complex gun. There are some subtleties, but uh, that's all. So for illustration purposes, uh, let me give an example for this class seven where you have a transpose symmetry squared to minus one, which has a bi orthogonal preference degeneracy. So the, the, its classification is Z2. And this 1D model, because of the degeneracy, has this uh, like degenerate pairs of bands. But when we double the system, it's possible to introduce certain uh, mass term to get them out, remove the winding, trivialize the system. But actually, this uh, reminds us of uh, 2D topological insulator in plus A2, 2D on the spin home, which has a time reversal symmetry, squared to minus one, which guarantees a Kramer's degeneracy, and whose classification is Z2. So uh, by this leads me to conjecture that there might be uh, some correspondence between this classification. So. Uh, more precisely, the long time dynamics of the non hermitian topological phase in D dimension resembles the anomalous boundary state of Hermitian topological phase in D plus one dimension. So if, if you look at this dispersion relation, it has like pairs of two pairs of left and right moving modes. But you see that like only a one pair has a positive imaginary energy and the other pair has negative imaginary energy. So only single one pair would grow over time, the other pair will like DK over time, so as a long time dynamics, you only observe a one pair. So in that sense, that's what I mean by long time dynamics. So in the line gap case, topological invariant gives us the bulk boundary correspondence, but for the point gap case, the topological information gives us what's actually like non-trivial for this like bulk dynamics itself. So that's one interpretation I have in my mind, but there can be something more as well, which is, I think, open question. So we define the non hermitian AZ dagger class. So it's actually, the, first we define the Kawata at all, and basically uh, CC star, which is a transpose symmetry square, is like prime universal square, and KK star is like a particle square. Then in this way we can define this non-Hermitian ace debit class. <clears throat> and then we can show that uh, the their topological classification actually matches exactly. It can be done by it can be shown by dimensional ascension. Uh, so when we double the Hamiltonian, we get this uh, additional chiral symmetry. And that if we had the additional like a momentum degree of freedom with that matrix attached to it, then can show that uh, S dagger class at dimension D maps to S class, permission S class in dimension D plus one. So their topological classification exactly matches. 
And one, so yeah, this is the result. So you can see that AZ class, and so this number here is the labeling of uh, our earlier work. So when we were labeling this, we had no, we had only like vague understanding of this correspondence, so we didn't relabel just by a number. But now that, now we know that this correspondence uh, we label by this like dagger notation. So there is this dimension shift, and there's this nice correspondence. So more intuitive picture is that when you have a Hermitian system with topological invariant n, uh, it's bound. It's still the non-interacting picture. You have this anomalous boundary state, which is a, like a Dirac cone. Then uh, you have corresponding non-Hermitian systems with like multiple Dirac cones, because like multiple Dirac cones, like a pair of Dirac cones cannot be avoided. But you should notice that like one Dirac cone would have a positive imaginary energy, and the other Dirac cone would have a negative imaginary energy. So you realize some anomalous dynamics at a long time in a long time. For example, you can think about a three-dimensional system with two vial points, but uh, as a long time dynamic, dynamics in a non-Hermitian system, only one dynamics would be observed. So, and this would have a point gap non-Hermitian invariant n. Okay, so this is the intuitive picture. If you're interested in the detailed proof, you can see this paper. So summary is that uh, non Hermitian systems have also uh, interesting like like features in its band structure itself, but also has very interesting correspondence between uh, to the Hermitian systems at one higher dimension. And uh, there are like lots of open questions in non Hermitian systems, so. I would like to encourage audience to uh, pay more attention to non mission systems. Thank you. Do you consider the interacting classes? Yeah, so interacting classification mm -hmm. is like one big open question that's actually very hard to think about because uh, when you think about the many body ground state, the energy now. <laughs> I took this with uh, Hassan, but when now the energy is complex, it's very hard to define ordering. And when you think of many-body ground state, I think ordering is quite important. So actually, one of the interpretation I have for non-Hermitian phase, like if you look at this kind of band structure, and the meaning of phase energy is that, like, so this is like non-Hermitian systems are intrinsically uh, like non-equilibrium. So. We are uh, meant to be meant to examine uh, its dynamics. So <coughs> I think space energy basically signifies what like energy uh, range we're interested in. So we can say shine the light onto the system at this like, real part of the base energy. And its topological information defined with respect to the space energy will tell us how like like the system would behave. Positive imaginary energy mean instability? Pardon? Doesn't positive imaginary part of the energy mean some mode that's growing? It's screwing, yes. Isn't that instability? Where does it go? Yeah, so the so if actually if you think about open quantum system dynamics, you can show that imaginary part of the energy can never be larger than zero. So so this is somewhat like <laughs> Yeah, I know this is a hypothetical situation that may describe something we don't know, but it, at least for the open quantum system dynamics, uh, this actually, this figure should be shifted as well. So one eigenmode would like stay the same, but like one below would like decay. So it cannot grow, because like the probability, it's like a probability, so it can not be what larger than one. What do you have in mind for the meaning of your special point in the space of energy then? Uh, <laughs> Zero. Yeah, so that's also a question I tried to avoid. <laughs> uh, so yeah, in the open quantum system case, it's indeed a problematic, but you can imagine some 
don't know, something that may be described by this kind of dispersion. But yeah, as you pointed out, uh, then we can define, okay, this is kind of reference kind of decay rate. And something became faster than that, we would see something became slower than that, we would see the kind of big boundary. So there, yeah, there are many things to work on. I mean, you can just write a paper on like how how are we how are we gonna define this? Then okay, it's gonna be a paper. So yeah, this but I think this correspondence is like an interesting thing. I actually have another but I mean I hate to be like a voice of conservatism given how much time I've spent thinking about ADSCFT, for example. But um, I, I'm confused about what is a context where you have an open quantum system, but where no entanglement is created with the environment, where you can nevertheless describe the system just by a wave function rather than by a density matrix? Uh, you... I mean, in general, if I have a quantum system which is coupled to something else, right. and that something else has degrees of freedom, yes. has more than one state, yeah. then when I time <coughs> the whole system, the system, Thing, the part you're interested in will become entangled right. with the rest of it. Yeah. In which case, if you want to describe it by itself, you have to describe it with a density matrix yes. rather than with a wave function, which right. is what you're doing. Yeah. So I don't understand a context where we can think about just a wave function. <coughs> Maybe this is a failure of my imagination. No, I, I think that's also the, the subtle point that mm -hmm. I don't know how to answer. So yeah, indeed, uh, the master equation is like rho, like evolving, but some non-region effective Hamiltonian. But now we just forget about this rho, we just think about property of effective non-region Hamiltonian. That's the strategy. Yeah. Okay, if no further questions, let's thank all the speakers. <laughs> <laughs>